Welcome to the Trauma Informed Lens Podcast. Each week, Matt, Kurt, Jerry, and the occasional special guest explore how the trauma informed paradigm challenges traditional beliefs and approaches concerning a wide variety of areas. This podcast addresses psychological trauma in an educational manner and is not designed to replace mental health treatment. If anything in this podcast makes you feel uncomfortable or anxious, please talk to a mental health professional. Welcome, friends, to episode 93 of the Trauma Informed Lens Podcast. I'm back here today with Jerry, continuing our big idea series over the summer. If you're just joining us, we're using John Haidt's uh, happiness hypothesis to really compare some of the bigger ideas in philosophy, religion, um, and society against some of the modern uh, science, neuroscience um, out there today. And it gives us a nice framework uh, to bring up some of these larger topics. Um, we're going to continue our exploration of these today with uh, tackling the issue of virtue. Uh, so not a small thing to cover. Uh, and if you're not reading the book, don't worry, we'll get you caught up uh, so you don't feel like you're lost in any way, shape, or form. So as always, we start out with our big shiny o- or our uh, bright shiny objects of the week. Uh, I'll start us out here, Jerry. So I was excited. I finally got my Whoop 3.0 strap. So uh, um, if you've listened to us in the past, you know we really nerded out uh, for a couple months on heart rate variability and I've been looking, I've, I've had a couple, I actually have a few things just hanging around my desk. I have a ear, uh, something you clip on your ear to measure heart rate variability. Um, I have a running uh, thing that you can measure it in. Um, but one of the things my, my frustration was is that none of these devices, they would measure heart rate variability for maybe three minutes and not take a measure throughout the day. And I was really excited the Whoop uh, 3.0 strap uh, measures heart rate variability uh, throughout a 24-7 period. Um, and actually, you can recharge it on your wrist, which I thought was one of their cool innovations. So um, I was really looking forward to the technology. Whoop really uh, is designed for elite athletes, which I am not an elite athlete. Uh, but at the same time, uh, I think how they measure heart rate variability during sleep is really cool they come up with something called strain and recovery. So even as somebody that works out five or six times a week, though, again, not at the elite level by any stretch, um, it's been interesting. I think that the most uh, insightful thing so far for me, Jerry, you might appreciate this, is um, I I ran, I'm I'm up to about kind of a half marathon, uh, sort of 13 mile pace. And over the weekend I ran, first time on the whoop strap, uh, ran 10 miles. It was kind of a, a, a lower, distance thing I'll probably run try to push 14 this weekend but um and then I did a half day training this week and my strain was actually uh, I had a higher strain score which meant I was more physically impacted by uh three hours of public speaking than I was from running 10 miles so I I thought that uh they usually look at elite athletes they get up they have a one through 25 scale of strain. And usually if you hit the twenties, they're blown away by your hard workout. And I hit an 18 on a day that uh, I did a half day training. So I'm really interested when I get back into multi-day trainings, uh, uh, maybe I will be working as hard as some of those elite athletes. So um, I think it's really cool technology. um, And I'm just excited that, uh, we've got this now 24-7 uh, measure of heart rate variability. I, I think, again, they kind of hit an end of the spectrum with elite athletes that's vastly different from uh, the folks we're talking about. But it's nice to see the technologies coming on board uh, that might allow us to get some more insight. It's all still based on your cell phone. So um, if you don't have a cell phone, it makes things difficult. But kind of cool. So uh, what, what are you thinking about this week, Jerry? So I uh, have been thinking about a, a couple of things. One is, is I was really, um, really excited to know that uh, our, our, se- our House of Representatives Senate passed the 9-11 uh, money for the first responders. Um, th- there's actually 20,000 new claims coming in um, related to that, and and you think about the impact trauma um, 
you know, that's cancer, respiratory, digestive issues, um, deaths. Um, so you think about the claims that are coming in, but then the impact on those on these people's families. And so trauma in the community continues to um, be an issue. And I think, uh, you know, the, the, the uh, finally to have some relief that, um, you know, managing your financial bills and stuff around medical costs is not going to be an additional stressor on these families. So um, I'm, I'm happy to, I'm happy to hear that. Um, you know, the other, the other issue I think is um, kind of um, watching these debates that are coming on. And I'm thinking about, um, you know, two years of this, right. It's like, it's, you know, how, how much can the American people really tolerate these kinds of things, right? It's like, when is it um, getting an adequate enough information and when is it um, entertainment and when is it um, a kind of overload? Yeah. Um, so I, I want to uh, kind of caution people over the next two years to titrate their exposure to these kinds of things. Um, because, you know, just like anything else, you're getting a perspective um, and it could stir you up in a positive way. It could stir you up. But I wonder how your heart rate variability will be impacted by uh, sure. both the debates and then the tweets around the debates. Yeah. Uh, so take care of, you know, take care of yourself as we move into this, uh, you know, uh, this phase of, of the process that. Um, in other country, it takes about three months. Yeah. Here we go for two years. Yeah. Um, amazing. Yeah, it really. Yeah, I, I was talking to you before. I was like, I, I can't do the whole debates. And, and like, I, I, I consider myself a, a very politically engaged person, but but I feel that exhaustion already. It's like I, I turned in around, uh, we're, we're on mountain time here. I tuned in around uh, 9 o'clock to see the talking heads talk about the debates. I was like, <laughs> I got, I got 20 minutes. I don't have like the two hours. I definitely didn't have the four hours for the two nights. And I'm like, uh, once they get down to kind of eight, then I'll start to, to look at who's going to excite me, who gets my five buck donation, those sort of things. But yeah, I've, I've had That's really... Fun. It's not kind of like the first round of March Madness for you, man. No, it's really, it's really not. It's like, it's like trying to like, and I hate how like, it's like, we've got to fight with each other. It's like, well, you can agree, like, but it's the moments where they put Biden to the dress. Like, oh gosh, just like, and I, I think I also find it interesting too, again, as somebody who's watching more of the highlights is, I think we got so ramped up by the Republican process where it was crazy town um that this is just kind of boring which is weird to say out loud it's just like yeah you know this isn't as crazy town as it was last time around so i don't know yeah our politics are an interesting thing right now um and right. Just take care of yourself take yes. care of that right Get Keep the energy because we'll need the energy right right <laughs> Those, those are my two uh, topics for the day. Excellent. So sort of speaking about our own resiliency, uh, with, with this, uh, uh, the chapter on virtue, there were a few things that I, I pulled out that, that I, I think are very relevant to uh, putting the trauma-informed lens on, on this topic. Um, and one is an issue we, we've talked about in a past episode about uh, sort of the relationship between uh, values, moral compass, um, resiliency and trauma recovery. And I, that's kind of what I took um, out of this uh, kind of the strength-based approach. And one of the ways that he talked um, about this, um, which is something that I've been a, a big fan of for, for several years, because I think it really added something was, was positive psychology. Um, just to give it, and Jerry, I want to, I'd love to get, I don't think we've talked about positive psychology uh, uh, really, really on this podcast uh, from a historical perspective, but from from my knowledge about positive psychology is really as it's a response to uh, we have this Bible of mental illnesses called the DSM out there, um, and we speak. I think I saw a study done um, several years ago that ninety percent of the peer-reviewed uh, journal articles are about disease and disability, and only ten percent 
about recovery and growth. And, and my understanding is this positive psychology uh, was really a reaction to uh, uh, that sort of mindset, that negative disease, illness, uh, disorder mindset in psychology. And I wonder, as somebody who has more of a historical perspective um, than I do on, on kind of your involvement in the history and growth of psychology, I just kind of wonder what, what's your thoughts, um, opinions, and experience of the, the positive psychology uh, movement within our profession? Um, big question. Yeah. Right? Big question again. So, you know, again, from my perspective, um, you know, prior to 1980, um, when the DSM was kind of created, you, you had camp, you had camp. So you had, um, psychoanalysis and you had, um, a, a lot of, um, descriptive, kinds of uh, ways uh, of talking about um, development and psychopathology. And, um, and, and I think that in the 19, um, really in the 1980s, 70s and 80s, um, there were a couple of things that were going on. One was, um, you know, you had behaviorists here in, in the United States trying to move away from um, kind of philosophical kinds of perspectives to more scientific kinds of perspectives. Mm -hmm. So you wanted to make psychology uh, a, a science instead of a philosophy. Yeah. Um, and when you made that move, you kind of ruled out a lot of things to kind of manage that. And the, you know, the DSM was supposed to move away from, um, it was supposed to be um, not a, um, an orientation. It was supposed to be a list of symptoms. However, in the right, original... Right, right, Jerry. It wasn't supposed to be used for insurance well, is initially. Well, so for the, for the first one, first of all, there, there wasn't a lot of... Um, validity to a lot of the writers, a list of symptoms. And, and really what was going on at the time is that um, we began to use medications. Um, and so we began to use medications, so a medical model to treat um, symptoms. Um, and we were, we were moving uh, people out of the institutions back to our communities using, uh, we were looking at um, and so there had to be a way for people, say, on the East Coast and the West Coast to, to talk about how are we using these medications to address certain symptomatology, mm -hmm. right? And so the, our model of kind of trying to get this list of symptoms under disorders um, really was, was our way of treating, and, and it, they weren't necessarily supposed to be in some ways supposed to be used for insurance that weren't supposed to, it was really a way of tracking, is this medication really addressing these kind of symptoms that we're kind of looking at to kind of manage that? And over, and over time, um, and it was really an anti-psychoanalysis, kind of wanting to kind of say is, you know what, we're not going to be diagnosing people with a neurotic disorder that, you know, due to their, um, conflict, internal conflicts over their mother and kind of whatever it was. So now we moved to a medical model system where there was a list of symptoms. I give you some prescriptive medication and we see if we can reduce those, right? As things have gone on, um, we created a whole industry around um, how you get reimbursed based on these symptoms. Um, not only that is is that over time there's been a much more, because it was easier to research util, utilizing these symptom packets and to say is, okay, somebody with a depression would meet these criteria. Now everybody in this, cat, in this research project, and now I'm gonna apply this behavioral or cognitive behavioral model. Mm -hmm. And we move back in some ways that a lot of the, the uh, 
the, a lot of the models that are utilized to kind of create some of these are really cognitive behavioral models that are beginning to look at. So a lot of somatic, a lot of the, and so, um, you know, this is the, this is the, the diagnostic system we had. And so, um, again, is this was done to treat psychopathology. Mm-hmm. It wasn't done to say, how do we create healthy individuals? How do we improve the well-being? Mm-hmm. Uh, our whole healthcare system was, was done, set up to treat illness, yeah. not health, mm-hmm. right? And so it's just been more, it was um, more recently that people began to look at this issue of ACEs and looking at this and thinking about how do we do prevention work to kind of look at that. And, and so you see this positive psychology, although it's not very applicable to some of the work that people are doing that are working in um, with pathology, right? And so, however, it is really important to understand this. So what do we need in our communities? What do we need in our schools? What do we need in, to kind of in somehow increase health instead of waiting to their symptoms to treat symptoms, to kind of looking at that. So I, I, I have always found it that it doesn't necessarily replace this kind of understanding. Um, the other piece is, is that we don't have the ability to take a human being and say, you know, let's um, really look at Let's stress the hell out of this human being and see how stress impacts it, right? And so what we do is, one is we look at animal studies, mm-hmm. which I know you have some reaction to that. But we also look at people who have been exposed to stressors and learn how stress or learn how certain um, exposure to certain toxins or whatever impact human beings so we study pathology, but it's always with the hope of saying, if this exposure creates this, what do we need to do to pro- provide positive experience to avoid that? Mm-hmm. So again, is understanding trauma, we should be also better at understanding resiliency. So we have to make that leap. And I think positive psychology was an attempt to make that leap to say, if these experiences or this um, these lack of these internal resources mm-hmm. leave somebody vulnerable to um, negative outcomes, how do we begin to create um, some opportunities for people to get exposed to certain things, um, experiences and um, opportunities to create positive outcomes? Yeah. So I think that it's just a natural progression. But, you know, when he talks about psychology lost its way, mm-hmm. um, you know, I, I think that there's some truth to that. Uh, you know, in order to find its way, it had to say, I want to be a science. And the science of the day was med- medicine. Mm-hmm. So it tried to kind of look at symptoms as, in some ways, symptoms and medicine treats symptoms. Mm-hmm doesn't necessarily treat people. So I don't, you know, giving somebody a diagnosis doesn't really tell me anything about the person that's sitting in front of me. Um, So I I think that we're trying to find that. And, you know, Dr. uh, Bruce Perry talks about that, you know, our diagnostic categories are very um, reliable. People can do that, but they're not necessarily valid. Mm-hmm. Right. So you can have 10 people look at this and give a similar diagnosis. But really, when we look at the underlying um, neurobiology that's impacted, there's not a lot of validity to how these kind of categories have been set up. Mm-hmm. But you could have somebody who has a depressive disorder and an anxiety to look way more similar than two people with a depressive disorder. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So I think that's some of the kind of challenges we have. And I think the, the chapter did a nice job of kind of advocating for health, a health perspective. 
Yeah. Well, and it, you know, it's interesting that that lost its way thing, because one of the things, I, you know, and, and I agree with that in, in his thinking around that, but, but I started when I was reading this, uh, of what I know of just the beginnings of psychology uh, with Freud and others, you know, really based out of uh, a lot of it working with uh, those who were struggling most um, in, in our society. So we, we were kind of, I, I think, as a an art slash science kind of born out of the, the disorder sort of thinking model, at least my basic understanding of the, the history of psychology, then Carl Jung and others kind of came around and gave a different approach to that, which was maybe less scientific even, you could argue, but a more interesting uh, read, if nothing else. And so it's interesting, I think, with the positive psychology is, you know, that this sort of, uh, I think, laser sharp focus, where I think it's always been health and wellness has been a part of psychology. I, I just love Siegelman and others coming in and like saying, okay, no, we, we need to really look at what we call in the trauma world, protective factors, uh, resiliency and, and other things. And I think it, it just adds that nice kind of balance uh, uh, to it because we are sometimes, you know, I, I, it got me thinking about, you know, most people I know in private practice are, are working with people who are struggling. How many mental health people are, are on that preventative end? And, and there are some, um, but how much of our field relies on people hitting that disordered sort of state and, and needing help responding. And so I always try to look at that, those bigger issues is what medicine may not be all that invested in wellness because they need sick people to justify and support financially their existence. So again, not, 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 a, uh, not, not to did, you know, disregard our whole field, but I think it's interesting over time how these very robust uh, systems of health are, are really, in some ways, as, as you point out a lot, really systems of illness uh, that will treat you once you sort of get there. And so, I think it's so, important for us to sit back and reflect on that every once in a while. So, so you know, I, I think it's interesting, uh, like, their approach to health psychology is, it's still based on, we're going to measure something and we're going to do it, right? So, you know, um, Buddhism is a study of the mind and they're doing for hundreds of thousands of years, but somehow it wasn't considered part of psychology until we could actually look in and see how some of the practices actually increased the health of the immune system and increased the health of, I'm kind of looking at it, and all of a sudden it now becomes part of positive psychology, right? So in some ways, I think, positive psychology try to do something different but try to fit in as well mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> and at the time that was the best approach to kind of doing it without being rejected right. by saying you're not but there's so many other things that we know for so many thousands of years are really are based in really good physiological understanding when we didn't really understand that before so it wasn't part of our our approaches now it is now you hear everybody talking about mindfulness yeah now you have everyone talking about talking about compassion um and acceptance um there's a whole a whole you know uh approach to treating people with acceptance and compassion therapies uh you know it's like oh, right this stuff isn't new it's been around for hundreds of thousands of years but somehow it got packaged dbt is based on some Eastern philosophies kind of looking at that. So there was a positive psychology before, it just was kicked out. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So we're, I think that's important to understand is that we didn't just reinvent it, it was there. We just kind of said, okay, now we have a way to measure so we can accept it into our uh, way of thinking. Absolutely, absolutely. So. The other thing that, that I really like, because this plays a big part in my thinking around motivational interviewing and cognitive behavioral therapy, um, is, is sort of the roles of both values, strengths, and he throws kind of virtue in there as well as kind of, I think, just kind of a big word. But I, I really like that he pointed out in, in his research, and I've really found this too, and it's a central tendon to, to motivational interviewing is 
really helping people uh, as part of their building resiliency, building strength, building motivation to to really help define what what are the rules you live by, what 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 guides uh, sort of what helps your moral compass find your north, so to speak. Um, and then that also that focus on strengths as well, because I think so many people, especially when, when I, I work in a, the adult fields of, of homelessness, um, addiction, um, th- those sort of arenas, I think so many people because of their personal narratives are so beat up by their trauma experiences, they don't see much strengths necessarily or resiliency inside themselves. And I think we can get caught in that too of just seeing the weaknesses. So this, this movement of positive psychology, but even before I heard the word positive psychology, uh, strength-based was, was something that I'd heard very early on in my training. And, and I just, I, I, I like how he comes to some of those similar conclusions of, you know, helping people to sort of find their, their core and how that plays in, in building uh, that, that resiliency piece. And I just wonder, you know, from, from a clinical perspective, as, as you're working with clients, um, when or if uh, do you have some of those conversations about moral reasoning, uh, values, virtue, um, sort of the rules they, they live their life by? Does, it, does that kind of come into your thinking at, at a certain point in, in the work that, that you do? You know, I, I think uh, later on in the treatment, yeah. clearly it does, is we're beginning to look at how to reintegrate and think about the future and think about, um, but lots of my clients don't have a future. Mm-hmm. Um, lots of my clients live in the moment of, of safety, but one of the ways that that comes in is when I'm working with a trauma victim to really begin to honor their survival strategies, um, the courage that they had, and they see it as in some ways, there's something wrong with me, there's, um, I didn't do enough to protect myself or I, I succumbed to this, but really kind of looking at how in some ways that was your strategy for surviving um, and really reframing this symptom as a strength mm-hmm. um, and to honor that uh, in terms of that, you know, as a, as a child, you couldn't get up and run away and you couldn't get up. And so dissociating um, and really becoming compliant um, and, you know, needing your, your abuses uh, needs so that you wouldn't get uh, hurt even worse, mm-hmm. or in, in some in, in some ways, um, kind of running away or whatever that was, is how to understand that in the context of your um, attempt to survive um, a, a horrendous experience. Mm-hmm. So early in the in the treatment, I'm not really as concerned with virtues and kind of doing it, which is we get to that piece as we're recreating the narrative and thinking about what, who do I want to be in the future and what do I bring and what. But so if you think about the stages of treatment in this initial phase, really, is we're trying to get um, a part of this um, individual to realize that what they were doing and how they were doing was really um, very adaptive and to do it, but it's now been somewhat overgeneralized uh, and they, and they don't need that in the same way, or there's other ways that they can protect themselves and kind of looking at that. So that, that initial or building in resources, you know, through EMDR or other somatic strategies to kind of help them feel good, find good pieces of themselves, find places of safety, find places. So building in those internal resources is an early stage of treatment. Later on, that does become an important part of the, what is it that they want to accomplish? How can they give back to people? Um, how can they get involved in, 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 in some ways, having um, feeling like they can contribute something to themselves and to others in a positive way to kind of looking at that piece. Um, 
but I, I think that um, really have to understand where, what stage of the process is this co person coming to me for? Mm -hmm. Am I stabilizing things or are we working on kind of helping that? And, and also, what is the clientele you're working on, right? So some clientele, really, you can get into this pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. um, where others who most of the people that I've worked with over my career have significant early childhood um, attachment problems and traumas in their lives. Yeah, and that's, I mean, it brings up one of the, the real uh, things that I struggle with on, on a regular basis uh, intellectually and in, in my work. Because one of the, the the ideal situation is again let's let's look at one of the extreme examples of of, of social issues and trauma with with homelessness for example is you've you've got this population who I would argue if you look at the dictionary definition of resiliency are are really in many ways the most resilient people in our society if if you look at the dictionary resiliency is getting back up from hardship well. The fact you wake up in a shelter and you survive with no home and you're pushing around everything you own in a, a shopping cart or in a backpack and you hope to God you get it, you know, win the lottery to get a shelter bed the next night. I mean, that's that that would be a big T or a traumatic event for me if you if you made me live one day in their shoes. They, they do that. Some people have done that for decades. And so there's this there's this interesting concept is that there's that resiliency there and we know but a lot of times the trauma and, and just socioeconomic issues all, all kinds of other issues but trauma i think is primarily one it sort of keeps them stuck in that that normalcy though that's a weird word to use around homelessness or extreme poverty or a domestic violence situation that that kind of becomes their their normal and, and one of the things i've really tried to think about because ideally we get everybody who's experiencing homelessness knowing that 90 plus percent i'm still kind of looking for the exception of the rule of people that are are sleeping in a homeless shelter in your community night are coming from a huge history of trauma um, both childhood trauma and oftentimes that goes way into their adulthood and if you take homelessness as a trauma which i really believe you could justify it being one you know that they're just engrossed in this trauma and they're not connected in a meaningful way to a trauma, uh, a therapist, uh, because of stigma around mental health, because they're more, maybe sometimes more uh, uh, driven to where am I going to get food today than going to a mental health appointment. Um, you know, all these folks, a lot of folks that I work with are trying to help people that aren't, you know, in the point to address the trauma, uh, try to find some motivation to get into a housing program, to get into mental health, to get into substance abuse and and one of the things that that i encourage them to think about though i think you know it's, it's just such a a tricky and and really complex work that these folks are doing is you know helping the individual see that their survival like you were saying uh shows how resilient they are shows you know to survive homelessness for a day takes a great amount of strength and ingenuity much less doing that for decades, much less doing that while managing a really devastating addiction on top of it. And, and so, so I try to kind of push it up a little bit, not because I argue with anything you're doing clinically, it's just like, how do we help people find that initial motivation to, because resiliency, they get back up and they face life every day, but then to take a step uh, towards a better future um, and helping them even see that that better future is possible. So I, I try to help people like how, how do we help them see their strengths? How do we use affirmations to reflect back? And is there any way we can incorporate sort of values questions of into some of our intakes, which often just re-traumatize people. So we get to know them in a way because when, when I know I, I talk to people about their values, I learn something very deep about them that's oftentimes more clinically useful than, you know, what's your psychiatric history, what's your criminal justice history, what's your domestic violence history, those sort of things. So, so it's just, you know, I, I, I love and I totally agree from a therapeutic perspective, your, your approach um, is, is dead on. Though, though I just kind of wonder if when we think about these intense situations like homelessness, um bringing that more up to the forefront to help people take the, the find the courage to take the step to go see 
uh, someone like you for, for trauma treatment. Is, is there, do you have any thoughts on maybe up kind of front loading some of these virtue conversations for individuals that we're trying to help find just a little bit of motivation to, to move forward into a better life? Um, <clears throat> well, first of all, I don't assume that the person I'm talking to um, wants mental health problems. Right, yeah. So, and I don't assume that they experience their situation as a trauma. Yeah. So what I have found is, is that um, when I, you know, the whole motivational interview, first of all, has an underlying assumption that somebody wants to make a change and I'm going to help them make a change. So I have to, in some ways, listen to where this person, where do they want to make a change, yeah. right? Not where I want to, I want to get them into housing or I want to get them into mental health and I want, so the best way that I know how to do that is <clears throat> I try to find out one is what do they want to talk about? Right? What do they want to talk about? What is that their goal in this interaction? So that we could find some place where our goals are aligned. Right? So now there's alignment. Um, so the first thing is there's a joint intention here. What are, we're doing something together. Yeah. The second thing then is how do I um, attend to what they're attending to? Right? Now we're joint, we're sharing something. There's an interactional process going on. So there's joint attention onto something. And finally, I try to have joint emotional interactions with them. to kind of looking at so, <clears throat> so if they're telling me about, you know, this person that they met on the street and, or, you know, who was doing it, it's like, wow, let's talk about that. As we're doing that, this begins to become a relational connectedness, mm -hmm. right? So then once we're connected, now I could start to say, so now tell me a little bit about what's it like for you living on the street? Yeah. Or what's, you know, it sounds like there's times you get really overwhelmed mm -hmm. or there's times you need to drink. Mm -hmm. However, but I, I don't go there until I have some connectedness with you, right. right? And so there's still a stage in that process where I think people think, okay, I'm going to start working on you to build in something. And who the hell are you to do that? To me? Yeah. Right? Well, well so, I would argue the, the system pushes I understand that, everybody but me, to do that. So, so I have found that I could do this sometimes in one meeting. Yeah. But I can't, I, you know, I don't want somebody coming in my house and telling me about how to rearrange something until they have a relationship with them. Right? <laughs> don't, don't come over for dinner and say, you know, you, that picture's in the wrong place. You should put it in here. Right? Great Join enough. with me first, and then I could be open to you telling me about maybe how to redecorate things. Yeah. All right. So I always try to, in some ways, have a level of engagement before I start to have those kinds of issues where I'm going to look at virtues or look at, uh, I, I have just not found in my life that people, people it's just almost like a rupture yeah. it, or a misattunement when I start moving to, and I have done it. I'm not saying I'm always good at this, but I, I can look at when I've been misattuned to somebody and I've moved because I had an agenda and it didn't match their agenda, they usually don't show up or they get mad at me or whatever. And then I go, oh, they're resistant. Mm -hmm. It's like, usually it's because I was misattuned to them in, in some respect. Absolutely. And it's just one of the things I, I always kind of make the joke because I never buy lottery tickets. But if I ever win the lottery and create the Sarah and Matt Bennett Foundation, because I always put your wife's name first. Uh, you know, my my intervention, what, what I would give back uh, in that foundation was, to hire additional staff so you would and train, make sure everybody's trained to create those, those relationships, but to give people more time. That's where I see, you know, the, the, as a therapist, I had 
a lot of times, I never even thought I had enough time as a therapist for some of the issues I was facing, but it just like for case managers and other folks, teachers as well. I mean, there's just this need to get people fixed, so to speak. And that, that push puts us, uh, I think we can quickly lose focus on, on the relational aspect, which is, again, as we mentioned pretty much every podcast, is the number one driver of outcome. So, so it's like ha- having system leaders understand that, yeah, this assessment, this report, those might be important, but we've got to really have this shared focus of how do we give people the skills? Because a lot of the people in these positions are not trained uh, master's level clinicians. How do we give people the skill set as well as the time to really build these relationships, maybe delay some of the assessments that could re-traumatize people and really think about this from a new creative perspective. And I think that's a trauma-informed way to look at uh, integrating some of these, these concepts. Right, so, so you're, I, I, I think your, your point of is, can we get to things quicker? Mm-hmm. And the answer is, yeah, when, once I, I have some level of engagement, yeah. I, could, I could guide somebody to ask, so what, is, what gets you up in the morning? What gets, what do you do, right? How do you, I can get, but I have to engage the individual in this process. It's yeah. not, and the thought of it is just because you're homeless, you should be engaged. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Because you see the need to be housed, right? Because <laughs> if I was, if I was in your shoes, I'd want a house, right? And it's, uh, yeah, it's some of this is just like, I wish you could stop and we, we can't stop because of the problems people need us today, but, and just step back and think about this from, from this perspective, which is why the, I, I do, I, I do like this book because it kind of does that, puts us in that stage. I wanted to finish up Gary, because I, I thought one of my big takeaways, uh, besides unfortunately his mention of faces of death, which I unfortunately, uh, I, I don't know how it got in a third grader's hand, but one of my friends got a hold of one of these videos and I can still pretty much walk you through the whole video. I, I wouldn't call it, I use the word trauma very, um, I don't throw that around lightly, but I, I get that he brought that up and I, it, so that really kind of triggered all those horrible memories of that movie. So if you have a kid and you search their room, if you see faces of death, take it out. It, it's uh, devastating. but. But besides my own history with, with that awful film, um, one of the, the big takeaways that I had, which kind of ties a lot of your, your comments over the last few episodes has been the virtue, the values, uh, sort of the morality we get from our community. Um, and I thought it was part of the interesting discussion is uh, we're, we're often very much focused in our modern uh, humanistic sort of uh, mindset of helping even young children create their own moral compass, their own set of unique values. And I think we both recognize that even when we encourage somebody to do that, they take the, the values of their culture, their religion, their community into that exercise with them. But But I thought it was an important thing to bring up is thinking about, you know, maybe more historically, uh, before we had the internet, before we even, a lot of people didn't leave, uh, you know, 20 miles from their house their entire life, that there, there was maybe more historically an ingrained shared values within a community. Uh, and I think this is, when you look at our political environment as a country right now, um, you know, one, our, our president tweets what many people, and I wouldn't argue against them, is racist tweets, um, which violates the values of a lot of us and supports the values of others. You know, I just kind of want your thinking, as, as you've spoken so much to the importance of community, um, I guess you're thinking about the importance of how communities, how, whether that's religious, geographical, um, ethnic, um, that, that those help us establish values and virtues in our life. And is, is any of the loss of community that I know you speak to so eloquently about, um, uh, does that mean there's sort of a loss of virtue in, in some way? I'd love to get your thinking on his, his putting those two things together. You know, my, my thought about it is, as a species, we survive by being 
connected to a group. Mm -hmm. And at some level, when we're not connected to a group, we are in a place of fear, right? And I think that um, the group comes together <clears throat> and provides regulatory capacities <clears throat> for, for us. And it also creates a shared system of meaning, mm -hmm. right? <clears throat> and so within this group, what's important and how we make sense of our world and we share that with people within our community that kind of looking at some of those things so that when we um, get disconnected from community, not only does our nervous system um, stay more on high alert, but we also aren't surrounded by people with shared sense of meaning of things from us to kind of look at that piece. And so as, as a young person, as I'm seeking out uh, connectedness and, and meaning, where do I go? I go to a, a great gang. I go to, I go, so I find those things in my life. But if we don't supply them by having a healthy community around us, it doesn't mean that we don't go seek it out. We seek it out and it's potentially unhealthy. Yeah. Um, and it's going to do it. So, you know, the, the, that, the, the goal of that community really is to teach those virtues, to teach those things, to teach the value, right? And, and I always, you know, when I worked in, um, I worked in, say, residential care, um, and these kids would come into care, and um, these kids would know of somebody who's going to kind of run away, um, and then the staff would get really angry at them and say, you didn't tell us what that kid's running away, as if they have the same system of values as we have, yeah. right? And, and you're going to get consequently because you should have told us to kind of looking at that, right? As opposed to what is your system of value that drove you to make that decision? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, being loyal. That is a very important survival and also important that I'm not loyal to you. I'm loyal to my group, yeah. right? It's like, well, that's a really important value to have. Right. But in some ways, if you didn't meet my because now you're part of this community, just because you got moved here, yeah. you're supposed to see the social values that I have. And these, and these kids and these families don't see the same. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they don't see it the same way. So community sometimes could uh, provide some really positive things. Um, but they also could create challenges as you move from one place to another. Mm -hmm. um, to kind of looking at that. And so there's another example of how could you stop and understand this person's system of meaning and what they're doing and how they're kind of being loyal or not being a snitch or however you kind of did it in their, in their community. That was way more highly valued than you going to these people who really say they want to be good, but really you're not part of my group. Yeah. Well, well, and I watched the movie you suggested last week, The Hate You Give, and I thought her, uh, and if you haven't seen it, I'll just reinforce what Gary said. You need to see it. Um, but but I, thought, I thought one of those key points is that she called out the community as well as the police. And that was seen by members of the community, especially the gangs, as snitching. So she was she was walking those two value-based worlds. And I think it brings to life this this piece. And, and and sometimes I thought, you know, boy, the white kids are really stereotyped as white kids. But you know, it gave that nice contrast between the community, the African American community she was coming from and the white community she went to school and how she in some ways was snitching uh, she was taking them both on um in a way that i thought was just incredibly done and I, I went to actually a movie i went to see the quinn tarantino's new movie which has really nothing to do with this conversation but <laughs> <laughs> it's good by the way it does have to do with trauma though it, well we could go into that but but i won't it's got a flamethrower involved in it which is 
is is neither here nor there. But I, I what I loved is during the previews, I think there were two or three previews for movies like uh, The Hate You Give, uh, powerful uh, African American white dynamic sort of empower empowered movies. So so it's really good to see like this voice come out. The, the other thing that I wonder, Jerry. I, I want to just stop for a second and, and think about is when you look at the movie and you say is, well, those are the stereotypical, right? Yeah. If you look at the lens from somebody coming from, that's how they see this. Yeah. It doesn't mean that that's reality. Yeah. But that's their reality. Yeah. Right? And so, again, is when we look at it, we go, oh, that's not who we are and that's not what... But really, that's who we look like to somebody coming into a treatment center. Yeah. That's who we look like from, and yes, we're different than that. We don't fit that. But in my, my, my system of meaning, you're these white people that are really don't understand how you're being. And so I, I think it's really important for a second just to say, boy, I'm having reaction to be seen that way. Yeah. Well, how many movies for how many years did the same thing to people of color? Exactly. Stereotype, right? Exactly. Yeah. And it's, I, I think it's uh, my, my kind of, I got a big kind of final question, which is probably not good to throw out this way in the podcast, but you know me. But you can't stop yourself. I can't stop myself. <laughs> Because I also, I, I think I shared that I watched the, the Vietnamese or the Vietnam documentary uh, from Ken Burns and just spectacular uh, documentary, but heartbreaking and uh, really hard to watch. So big trigger warning if you, if you follow my advice to see this. But, but the one thing, Jerry, that, that I kind of wonder is what our country is going through right now is that that it seemed and I wasn't alive except for the very end of of the time frame in Vietnam and I have no memory of it whatsoever as a young child is there there seemed to be this point which probably existed in some way but it became very extreme where people no longer trusted their leaders um so it, you know it was fascinating because then I've been just nerding out it's my way to cope with work stress right now is uh, documentary. So it was interesting because I watched this great World War One documentary afterwards, and it, it was amazing how quick people were to jump when America got in the war. We were all in. Like everybody was signing up. Everybody was. There's sort of this euphoria, whether it was the Germans, the French, of hey, we're going to war, right? And there was a kind of a questioning about the the why so much, even though I'm sure it existed in small groups like the the Quakers and and others. And I just kind of wonder, I, I contrast where we are as a country to some extent where our state of Colorado is. Because if you walk around my neighborhood, I, I just did this to prepare for the podcast, you'll see a lot more Colorado flags than you do American flags. And, and not to say you don't see American flags, they're there, but, but we live in a place of pride. Uh, going back to Indiana, you hardly, I don't think I saw one Indiana sock or hat or flat hoosiers i yeah you would see our, our <laughs> and iu purdue you would see a lot of that but but we live in a state where i i'm sure the the sales of colorado logoed socks reaches 10 million dollars plus a year and i just kind of when we think about community i feel like we've lost community in our country and maybe it never existed in the way the documentaries I see on the 40s or 50s. And obviously it didn't exist for people that weren't white, middle class, upper class folks. So, so to put that out there, but I just kind of wonder like when you look at the state of our country is now from, from where you've seen it in the past, is it, just, is it kind of a continuation of what you've seen? Or, or do you think we're in this dangerous place where we don't see each other as, that's, even though we might live in the same neighborhood, we don't see each other as, as neighbors or a community anymore because we, we yell too much at each other? You know, um, you, you, I don't know how to answer that question, first of all. I think it's a good observation to do it, but I, I share something of my own experience, right? Is that when we start to talk about things, 
For example, when I ran a treatment center, it was very important for us to be able to talk about issues of race. Yeah. Right? But we really didn't know how to talk about issues of race because everything triggered everything. Yeah. Right? And in a way, um, in order to kind of go back to saying, in order to change, we've got to go back and look at how we saw the world and then feel shame and guilt and anger and people to kind of do it. But we had to create a safe enough place for people to do that. So talking about that in small safety places was probably more productive than just opening those issues up in large meetings and kind of looking at that, right? And I think these issues of gender equality and racism, when they're put out in the media, they're very important for us to do it, but they're not the best places for us to resolve these issues because even like you think about Joe Biden, Mm -hmm. I bet he had a lot of sexes. He was brought up at a time in which those things, and he has to come to terms and say, yes, I did think that way, but I, and I feel kind of reflecting on it, but I don't feel that way. But he has to have a place that's safe enough for him that allows him to own it as, a, as opposed to attacking him for the way he used to yeah. be able to kind of do it. And so I think what's really nice as a country, we're starting to talk about really difficult issues and they're coming to this because they're in our face and this president is throwing him in our faces. So it's an opportunity. But it also creates safe, it also requires safety. It requires relational connectedness. It requires me being able to hold your experience without feeling responsible for your experience and you holding mine without. I mean, these are really difficult things we're trying to do as a country right now. Yeah. And I challenge people is like, yes, there's a, there's a, there's really abusive men that are out there that have done things. But there's a whole continuum of men who are struggling with what does it really need to be a man and how can I do that today? And I don't know in this new world what that looks like because I was brought up in this old world. And racism and kind of looking at that. We need to find a place to kind of teach people how to hold these kind of conversations. Mm-hmm. We, if we're going to come together as a community – we really do need to kind of hold the hold, teach, not expect that we know how to do this. Yeah, we haven't been brought up in a, in a, in a society that the we're pushing people at a new level now because of this president. At some level, somebody said we're going to look back and thank Donald Trump someday because he made us realize how valuable freedom is and how easily it could be taken away. But right now is. He's forcing us to have conversations that are really difficult to have. And I think it's really important for us to have um, compassion for each other, to have a sense of we've all done things and have views that one is, is I look at back on my own life about how I was raised and there's things I should feel bad about and guilty about, but there's also in order to change, I've got to look at those things. Yeah. Exactly. But I also need to have somebody who said, I love you, even though you had that and kind of bring, and you could be a part of our community, not I'm going to attack you for that. Piece. Absolutely. So I think that this is a perfect opportunity for us here in Colorado to model for the country, not just, oh, we're going to make believe in a socially, in a socially acceptable way. We're kind of this way, but really how do we have these deep conversations? Yeah and really moved it, move us individually and collectively to a place in which we really do have tolerance for diversity, um, respect for each other, and, and really a sense of community. Wonderful. Wonderful way to end it. I think I could continue this for another hour, but I want to I wanna let your wisdom uh, trail you us it, out. You brought, it up, you brought it up at the end. I, I know, I know. You did a great job. You did a great job. So... As always, you can find uh, discussion questions, uh, show notes, and everything else at traumainformlens.org. And uh, 
we'll continue. We've got a few more weeks of our series. Jerry, this was fun. Uh, learned so much as always. And you know, I want to end by saying I was with somebody um, this week who lives in Texas who listens to us. And he said, oh, you know, I want to come on your show one time and share my thoughts. Or I want to come. And I invite people. One is if they have really important things to say is to write in or to yes. do it. And if we read it and you do it and you have something really important to say, maybe you can come on the show and kind of do is really reach out. Let's try to make this a, a community of learning. Wonderful. Yes. And uh, uh, I need new topics too. So that would be <laughs> I got to create these show notes every week. So uh, we would so love to have you on our show. Write in and ask to come on, man. Yes. Give, give us your idea. Maybe I'll even let you write the show notes and discussion questions. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> We're all about empowerment. So, uh, Gary, <laughs> great, great discussion, and uh, we'll right. see everybody next week. All right, bye bye.